to the table of contents, getting an idea of the categories and what's in them. So I've only talked so far about the generic stuff. Now we get into the real meat of the biodiversity, the locations of things, the events that capture like, the date, the product sampling protocols and the efforts, telling us about field notes and field numbers and habitats, month, day, year, day of year, all that sort of thing having to do with the time and the protocol. Everything about location, including innumerable fields about georeferencing. A whole bunch of fields about paleontological terms. And finally, the last two, the identification terms and the taxon. Okay, so these are the categories of Darwin Core and the fields that populate them. Now, if you had a database with every Darwin Core field populated, it would be 160 some columns wide. And no one, to my knowledge, has ever published a spreadsheet with every one of those Darwin Core fields filled. That's not exactly the point. The point is to have a place to put it if you have those data. Not all of them necessarily apply to your data. Okay? So you can construct a perfectly valid Darwin Core spreadsheet or Darwin Core table or Darwin Core archive, anything, and call it Darwin Core if it consists of fields from this list of terms. And it doesn't matter if they're all there or if they're just a few. The value of that resource, that spreadsheet, or that database, will be determined by a couple of different things. One is how many of those fields actually are filled, and the other is what are they filled with? Are they filled with garbage, or are they filled with something useful? Garbage can come in a couple of different forms. One is if the values in those terms aren't really relevant to the term. If I put a tax on let's say a scientific name, where is it? Scientific name. If I fill the scientific name with a number, it's garbage. It's not what scientific name means. Why? Well, let's go find out. The scientific name is a full scientific name with authorship and date information if known. When formatting part of an identification, this should be the name of the rank, uh, sorry, it's cut off. Anyway, it's a scientific name. So here are plenty of examples. If you only identified something to an order, then the name of that order would be in the scientific name field. On the other extreme, if you had identified something to a, uh, to a genus and uh, species with the author information, then you can put all of that in there. It's a valid scientific name. So we're trying to put the name as specific as it was applied to the specimen or observation. Doesn't say anything about putting numbers in there. Numbers are not valid scientific names. So what do we do if our database, for whatever reasons, consists of a bunch of IDs for taxon names instead of taxon names? Well, Darwin Core has a way to share those as well but it's a different field. If we go back to the taxon list, you can see that there's a taxon ID field. So this really is for identifiers. It's an identifier for a set of taxonomic information. So here's one. It's a whole URL. Okay, if you go to that URL, you're going to find a whole bunch of information about that species but it's not a scientific name, right? This is an identifier for the species. Here's a number. There are identifiers that allow you to look up the scientific name information. So that's why there's a distinction and that's why there's so many different fields in the Darwin Core. Okay. Any questions about any of that so far? Important thing for us at the moment is that these terms all have very specific definitions and we want to fill fields following those definitions. 
Some of them recommend that you follow a control vocabulary, such as that basis of record field. If you have preserved specimens, you should put preserved specimen in there. You shouldn't put some other word in there because it's supposed to be controlled. Okay? Any question about that? The other important thing is for you to understand what I mean by simple Darwin core. Simple Darwin core is Darwin core that we could put into a spreadsheet with one column per term. We're not going to complicate it by having multiple identifications or multiple images or multiple anythings. Okay? It's going to be one record is one specimen. Now, what if I want to do better than that? What if you want to design a database and you want to keep track of a history of identifications? Right? I don't want any of you saying, well, John said we should use Darwin Core. and Darwin Core doesn't support having a history of identification, so I didn't bother to do it. No. When you construct your databases, they should be constructed to do the work that you're supposed to do, not to follow some standard. The standard is what we want to use when we share information, so we know what we're both talking about. When you construct your database, it should be so that you are able to do your work. It's easy, one of those easies, to transform your data into Darwin Core. That's what one of our exercises is going to be about this afternoon. We'll take an existing data set. It's got its own column names. Some of them are recognizable as Darwin Core terms. Many of them are not. What we're going to try to do is to turn that data set into a Darwin Core data set by saying this field in the original is this field in Darwin Core and see what kind of a challenge that can be. There are different kinds of challenges, and we like to see what those are. Because that's the process that has to happen when you're going to share data from its original form to the rest of the world. So now, okay, but John, I want to have identification histories. Or maybe even more importantly for our group, I want to have a list of the images for a specimen. Right? I don't want to be limited to one. I see that there's a term here in occurrence called associated media. Okay, if I look at that for a moment, it says it's a list, concatenated and separated, of identifiers such as publications or glo global unique identifiers or URIs of media associated with an occurrence. And it gives an example. This whole long URL is where to find an image about this specimen, presumably. This example only shows one image. If I had multiple images of the same specimen, I would put some kind of a separator after the first one and put another one on the list. In this way, I can create at least a Darwin Core term in simple Darwin Core that contain a list of images. But John, that's not good enough. I want to know who gave me the image. I want to know its title. I want to know what format it's in. How do I share that information? I can't do that here. Darwin Core won't let me do that. So now I need to introduce a new concept of extending the Darwin Core in which there is a simple Darwin core that contains the specimen information on one side. You can think of it as a spreadsheet of the specimen stuff or a table of the specimen stuff. And on the other side, I have a table or spreadsheet of the image stuff associated with the specimens. And they're linked together with each other. The way they're linked together with each other is through identifiers on both sides. So if I go back to this list, of terms, a specimen should be given an identifier in this field called occurrence ID. That's what it's meant to do. In our own databases, our own specimen databases, we probably use this thing called, where are we? Catalog number. 
right? Most um, specimen databases will use a catalog number of some kind. And that allows you to distinguish one specimen from another within that collection. But now, wait, we're sharing this information across the globe. How many institutions do you suppose have a catalog number one? More than just you. So that number one in a catalog number field is no longer sufficient to distinguish specimens when we start putting it all together. Right? So it allows me to tell it allows me to tell you, hey, I'm interested in your catalog number one when I come to you to ask about more information, but not to distinguish between all of them in the world. So what I do instead is I use an occurrence ID, which takes the identification of information to a global level. So that the value in occurrence ID should be something that's globally, globally unique. Nobody else in the world uses this identifier for their specimen. How do we do that? There are lots of ways. There's going to be a whole talk on how we do that tomorrow. But briefly, the th one thing that's done quite commonly right now, because pretty much everyone can do it, is to create an identifier out of a combination of identifiers in the original record. So, okay, we have all got a catalog number one. And some of us also have mammal collections, right? So my mammal collection, my collection is called mammals. And my catalog number is called one. So if I combine those two, mammals number one. Okay, now I know which database to look in at your institution, but I still don't know what institution to look in. So now let me combine the three, an institution code, a collection code, and a catalog number. So now I look in the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, mammal collection, for catalog number one. And there is only one Museum of Vertebrate Zoology with that name. That's a requirement. With that collection and that catalog number. So the combination over the world, in theory, should be unique. And I can use it. It's not actually a very robust rule for creating unique identifiers because there is competition for institution codes. There might be more than one ABC collection in the world. That sort of thing has to be resolved among the collections. There are better ways to do global unique identifiers. I'll get into those details tomorrow in that talk. But the point now is that I have a way with an occurrence ID as an identifier for a specimen that is globally unique that I can use anywhere in the world. And what I want to do is I want to relate my occurrence ID for my specimens to my occurrence ID for the images associated with those specimens. So that on both sides, there's a occurrence ID. So if I look on the list of specimens alone, there's an occurrence ID field and I see occurrence ID MVZ mammals one. I know immediately what that image is for. And if I want to find the details about the specimen, I look in the other table for MVZ mammals one. And it gives me all the occurrence information. This way, I have two tables, one for specimens, one for images, and the images one is telling me which specimen it is connected to through an occurrence ID. Okay? Don't worry too much if that didn't work for you because we're going to talk to in more detail about identifiers and about how to create more complicated models than just simple Darwin core for the purposes of capturing multiple images as an example. Okay? Now, I've talked a little bit about the theory of how you would do this. In practice, how do you share such information in Darwin Core? John told me that there's this thing called simple Darwin Core and you're only supposed to have one record for every specimen. But I want to share multiple images for every specimen. The way you do that is through a Darwin Core extension. And I think that it's probably a good time to stop, use that as a uh, the lead-in for talking about this next whole section after we come back from lunch. So we'll talk about expanding Darwin Core in a different way at that time. Before we do, is there any question about this? This is very fundamental to sharing data, understanding how Darwin Core can be useful, how to use it, 
is going to be essential. And to be able to actually do the exercises for the afternoon, you have to understand what I'm telling you. So, do you have any questions about it so far? <laughs>